Φερμά το Τεχνολογικό Ιδρύμα Νόηση, το προσωπικό του, ε, το οποίο μα βοήθησε να γίνει αυτή η ομιλία, με κάθε μέσο που διαθέτανε, και ιδιαίτερα το πρόεδρο του Νόηση, πρώην του Τεχνικού Συμβουλίου, τον Νόηση κ. Βαρβούτη. Ευχαριστώ που έρθατε εδώ και ελπίζουμε ότι μετά από αυτή την ομιλία πολλοί θα σκεφτούν λίγο διαφορετικά το τι μπορεί να μας δώσει ελεύθερο λογισμικό και πώς μπορεί να προχωρήσει την Ελλάδα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Παρακαλώ τον κύριο Σόλου Μασοπίδη να προσέχετε για να μας πει δύο λόγια για την Ένωση Λίγμα του Ιστάνου Ελεύθερου Λογισμικού. Ο κύριος Αφήτης είναι μέλος του Συλλόγου της Μη Κυβερνητικής Οργάνωσης Ένωσης Ιεμινικών Χριστών Ιεθροβισμού. Να σας καλησπέρισω και εγώ με τη σειρά μου και να σας καλωσορίσω στην ομιλία μας. Γνωρίζω πως αρκετοί ανάμεσά μας έχουν ταξιδέψει αρκετά χιλιόμετρα για να παραβρεθούν απόψε μαζί μας. Και αυτό με χαροπεί αρκετά. Ε, Όπω σα είπε και ο φίλο Κώστα, ονομάζομαι Σαββίδη Όλων και είμαι μέλο του συλλόγου μα. Ε, και θα σα παρουσιάσω μια σύντομη αναφορά στο έργο και την ιστορία του συλλόγου μα. Ε, πριν ξεκινήσω, όμω, θα ήθελα να σα πω πω ε, στα χαρτιά που κρατάτε στα χέρια σα και στι αφήσει μα ε, γράφει το ότι προηγούμενη ονομασία μας, Greek Loop, η οποία, η οποία πλέον έχει αλλάξει και είναι η gnu.gr.org, το οποίο θα ήθελα να το διορθώσετε. Ε, ξεκινώντας, όλα ξεκίνησαν από μια μικρή παρέα ανθρώπων, οι οποίοι είχαν κοινά οράματα και ανησυχίες πάνω στο ελεύθερο λογισμικό. Η πρώτη φορά που ήρθα σε επαφή μαζί τους ε, ήταν σαν τους γνωρίζω χρόνια. Σημάδι πολύ σημαντικό που μου έδωσε ιδιαίτερη χαρά ε, περιμένοντας από το τι θα έρθει μελλοντικά. Κάθε φορά που βρισκόμουν μαζί τους ε, παρατηρούσα με μεγάλη μου χαρά πως η παρέα αυτή μεγάλη και εμπλουζητινιζόταν με ανθρώπους κάθε φορά. Άνθρωποι με κοινέ φιλοδοξίες, με τα ίδια οράματα και την ίδια αγάπη για το ελεύθερο λογισμικό. Ο καιρός πέρασε, η ομάδα μεγάλωσε, η παρέα έγινε πιο δυνατή 
Και ήρθε η στιγμή που έπρεπε κάπου να στεγάσουμε όλες τις φιλοδοξίες μας και τα όνειρά μας και έτσι έγινε η πειτακτική ανάγκη να δημιουργηθεί ο Σύλλογος. Χωρίς να φοβηθούμε πολλά πράγματα και τα τύχη που είχαν ψωθεί μπροστά μας, όπως οικονομικά, είτε οργανωτικά, είτε κάποιοι άνθρωποι οι οποίοι μας είχαν προειδοποιήσει ότι ο δρόμος για έναν σύλλογο είναι πολύ δύσκολος. Τα παραμερίσαμε όλα αυτά, δεν φοβηθήκαμε και ξεκινήσαμε. Σίγουρα δεν ήταν κάτι εύκολο. Από την πρώτη όμως στιγμή που το κάναμε αυτό, τα έργα μίλησαν. Ομιλίες για το ελεύθερο λογισμικό, μαθήματα για τη χρήση αυτού, είτε στο Σύλλογο, είτε στο Πανεπιστήμιο Μακεδονίας, σε σχολεία και εκπαιδευτικά ιδρύματα. Οργανώσεις ε, Release Party Blue Linux Διανομών και Software Freedom Days. Ε, με αποκορύφωμα φυσικά σήμερα να έχουμε προσκεκλημένο μας, να μας έχει κάνει αυτή τη μεγάλη τιμή, να είναι μαζί μας ο Ρίτσαρ Στάλμαν, ο ιδρυτής και εμπνευστής του Ιδρύματος Ελεύθερου Λογισμικού. Μπορεί όλα να λειτουργούν σαν σύλλογος, παραμένουμε όμως μια μεγάλη παρέα με διαφορετικούς ανθρώπους ανάμεσά μας, με διαφορετικές ηλικίες και επαγγέλματα. Δεν είμαστε όλοι hackers ή επαγγελματίες της πληροφορικής. Αυτά τα άτομα ίσως είναι μετρημένα στα δάχτυλα του ενός ιδιού. Έχουμε πλουραλισμό στους ανθρώπους, πράγμα που αποδεικνύει ότι όλοι μπορούν να ασχοληθούν και να προσφέρουν στο ελεύθερο λογισμικό. Θα χαρούμε πάρα πολύ να σας δούμε στα γραφεία του συλλόγου μας, να περάσετε, να γνωριστούμε και να μοιραστούμε τις απόψεις μας, τις ανησυχίες μας και τις εμπειρίες μας πάνω στο ελεύθερο λογισμικό. Ο Σύλλογος είναι ανοιχτό πάντοτε για όλους και όλοι είναι ευπρόσδεκτοι. Επίσης, θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω όλα τα μέλη του Συλλόγου, αλλά και τους ανθρώπους που προσπάθησαν για να έρθει αυτή η μέρα και να ολοκληρωθεί, για να φτάσουμε εδώ πέρα που είμαστε, τους αξίζει όλους ένα μεγάλο μπράβο. Και μια υπόσχεση προς όλους ότι τα καλύτερα τώρα έρχονται. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ.
What is free software? Free software is software that respects the user's freedom. And the community, the social solidarity of the user's community. So it's free as in freedom. We're not talking about price. We don't mean gratis software. We mean freedom respecting software. It's clearer in Greek because you can say elethero and it doesn't mean zero price. So when you're speaking Greek, don't use the English word free. Say elethero. <clears throat> in English, I have to explain Think of free speech, not free beer. <coughs> to understand the correct meaning of the word free in the term free software. By the way, has the air conditioning been turned on? It doesn't feel that way. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> software which is not free, we call proprietary software, non-free software, user subjugating software. It's a system of digital colonization that keeps the users divided and helpless. You know, divide and rule is an old policy, but now it's being practiced through computer software. The users are divided because they are prohibited from redistributing copies, prohibited to share. <clears throat> They're helpless because they don't have the source code. So they can't change the program. They can't even tell what it really does. And often these programs have malicious features designed to mistreat the user. But what I've said is very general. Software that respects the user's freedom. What freedom is it? There are four essential freedoms that define free software. A program is free software if you, the user, have these four freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so that it does your computing the way you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help other people. That's the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others when you wish. So if the program gives you these four freedoms, then it's free software because the social system of distributing and using that program is an ethical system, one that respects freedom and community. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is proprietary software, which means that it imposes an unethical social system on its users. Thus, if you want to live in freedom, you need to avoid proprietary software. Any proprietary program takes away your freedom. <clears throat> As you can see, this is not a technical question. It's not a question of how the code is written, or how the code works, or what job it does when it runs. It's a question of the social arrangements for using the code. So the same code can be distributed as free software or as proprietary software, and in some cases it's distributed in both ways in parallel. This is a social, ethical, and political question, not a technical question. The use of a free program in society is development. It's increased knowledge available to society for use. Free software is software that the citizens of any country or city can study, understand, maintain, adapt, and extend. Use of proprietary software is not development, it's dependence. To develop a free program, 
is a contribution to society. How much of a contribution, that depends on the details. But developing a proprietary program is not a contribution, it's a power grab. It's better to do nothing at all than develop a proprietary program because if you do nothing at all, then at least you're not doing harm. So, the goal of the free software movement is that all software be free so that all software users can be free. But why are these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom to, the freedom to help others, the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish, is essential on basic moral grounds. So you can live an upright, ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program that denies freedom too, you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment. Whenever your friend says, that program seems useful, could I have a copy? In that moment, you will face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. <coughs> the other evil is to refuse your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. If you are in this dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. What makes this the lesser evil? We can presume that your friend is a good friend and a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. By contrast, the developer of the proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community. So, if there's no way to avoid doing wrong to one or the other, you should do it to the developer. <clears throat> the developer deserves it. <laughs> However, being the lesser evil does not make it good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it. Because not even in cases like this one, where the agreement itself is evil, and keeping the agreement is worse than breaking it, still breaking it is not good. And if you give your, uh, if you have a portable tracking and surveillance device, please switch it off. They have already tracked you here. They know you're listening to me. So there's no need to keep sending out signals to inform them that you're still here. And if they want to hear my speech, they don't need to use your portable tracking and surveillance device in eavesdropping mode, where it transmits the conversations around you and doesn't ring or show you any sign that it's doing so, because a recording is being made and they'll be welcome to watch. <clears throat> Now, the reason, of course, that you can't control what these devices do is that they have proprietary software in them. <clears throat> and if you want to be sure they're not sending out signals saying where you are, you have to take the batteries out. It's the only way to reliably be sure. You see, with software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. <coughs> with free software, the users control the program, and nobody has power over anybody else. With proprietary software, the program controls the users, and the developer controls the program. So the developer has power over the users. So anyway, 
So even, even though breaking this agreement is the lesser evil, it's still not good. And if you give your friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program. And that's a rather nasty thing. Almost as nasty as an authorized copy would be. <laughs> so, when you have fully understood this dilemma, what should you really do? You should make sure you are never in this dilemma. But how? I know two ways. One is, don't have any friends. <laughs> the other is, don't use the program. Reject software that denies you freedom to. When someone offers me a program on the condition I not share it with you, I say, my conscience does not allow me to accept that condition, so take your evil software out of here. And that's what you should say. Reject software that forbids sharing. And reject also the propaganda terms that the proprietary developers use to demonize cooperation. For instance, terms like pirate, when they call people who share pirates, what are they really saying? They are saying that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking from ships. And morally speaking, nothing could be more false than that. So they shouldn't be called by the same name. Refuse to call these people pirates refuse to describe sharing as piracy. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say, attacking from ships is very bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason for freedom too, the freedom to help others, the freedom to redistribute exact copies to others when you wish. And I should point out that each of these four freedoms is literally the freedom to do a certain thing if and when you wish. You're never required to do so. You don't have to share a copy with everybody who asks. The point is you should be free to do so when you wish. So that's the reason for freedom too, the freedom to redistribute exact copies, essential on basic moral grounds. But freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason. So you can control your computing. There are proprietary programs whose licenses <coughs> restrict even the use of authorized copies. For instance, there is a program for managing a website whose license forbids using the program to publish anything that criticizes the developer. In this case, proprietary software literally takes away your freedom of speech. <clears throat> so, <coughs> what can I say? If you're not even allowed to use your copy as you like, then you don't control your computing. Your control has been taken away through the license of that software. So freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential. But it's not enough, because that's the freedom to either do or not do whatever the code is set up to do. Which means the developer still controls what you can do and what you can't do. Not through the license, but instead through the code of the program. In order to control your own computing, you need, therefore, freedom one. The freedom to study the source code and change it to make the program do what you wish. This way, you decide instead of letting the developer impose his decisions on you. If you don't have freedom one, you can't even tell what the program is doing. 
And many of these programs have malicious features designed not to serve the user, but instead to spy on the user, restrict the user. There are even back doors to attack the user. And this is not something rare that would happen once in a rare while when you're unlucky. This, these malicious features are found in very common proprietary software. One proprietary program you may have heard of that has all of these three kinds of malicious feature is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> People have found spy features that send messages reporting on the use of the machine. Of course, the digital handcuffs designed to restrict what the users do with the files in their own computers, those are visible. Because when the software says, you are not permitted to do that in your own computer, of course the users see that they're not being permitted. But the back doors that give Microsoft the ability to give, give commands to someone else's computer, those are not visible. People had to study cleverly to discover this. But Microsoft has a back door in Windows that it can use to forcibly install changes in software. Any change in any software in the machine, Microsoft can install without asking permission of the nominal owner of the computer. I say nominal owner because when Microsoft has Windows running in that computer, Microsoft has owned that computer. Whatever malicious feature Windows does not have today, it might have, Microsoft might put in tomorrow. We know that the security <coughs> of Windows is pretty bad. But the security of Windows against Microsoft is not just bad, it's zero. But the Macintosh is malicious too. It has digital handcuffs. Digital handcuffs are also known as DRM or Digital Restrictions Management. And in addition, Apple has provided optional upgrades, which practically speaking, the users were compelled to install. The newer Apple products, such as the iGrown and the iBad, <coughs> are nastier. They have back doors. And for instance, Apple has gone so far as to impose its control over what applications users can install. They can only install the applications that Apple approves of. And not only that, with, its, with a back door, Apple can de-install an application. If Apple approved an application a month ago, and today Apple decides it's not approved anymore, Apple can send messages to de-install that application from iGrowns and iBads. <clears throat> so, these are thoroughly malicious products. And then there's the Adobe Flash Player. The Adobe Flash Player has a malicious surveillance feature, which is called Super Cookies. They are like the cookies in a browser except that browsers give users some control over when they're permitted, and the Adobe Flash Player does not give users control. Each sites can even detect that the same person is talking to both sites by communicating through the Flash Player. So, having that program in your computer makes you vulnerable. You should definitely not, not have that. <clears throat> In addition, it has digital handcuffs. And then there's the Amazon Swindle. That's not the official name. Amazon calls it the Kindle. 
This is an e-book reader. What is an e-book? Strictly speaking, an e-book is a book in digital form. There's nothing particularly bad about that. But in practice, when companies talk about e-books, they mean e-books with digital handcuffs designed to restrict the user and take away the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, one thing that we're free to do with books is buy them anonymously by paying cash. That's the only way I buy books. But most books, for most books, the only place a swindle user can buy them for the swindle is from Amazon. And Amazon demands that the users identify themselves. Which means that Amazon makes a list of all the books every user has bought. Now that list is so dangerous to freedom and democracy that we cannot tolerate its existence anywhere. Other traditional freedoms of readers include the freedom to give away a book or lend it to a friend or sell it perhaps to a used bookstore. The digital hand handcuffs in the swindle take away those freedoms. No more lending books to your friends, which means among readers, no more friendship. And then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish. The swindle takes that away too. We discovered this, it's, it's done with a back door. And we discovered this last year because Amazon used the back door spectacularly, deleting a large number of copies of a particular book, copies that people had bought from Amazon. And the book with which Amazon demonstrated the Orwellian nature of its product was 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> if I were writing fiction, I would consider this too unbelievable. I wouldn't dare make this up. But sometimes the truth is more unbelievable than fiction. Oh, I believe they deleted Animal Farm also. <laughs> and the swindle is known to do spying on in other ways. For instance, the notes and underlining that users write gets transmitted to Amazon and published. So, it's an extremely malicious product, and there are many others. But I won't claim that all these proprietary programs that deny you freedom one are malicious, because, have malicious features, because I don't know. There's no way to tell. Without the source code, we can't check what they do. So there are a few of these programs where we know about malicious features, and then there are many others where we just don't know. I presume some of them have malicious features and others don't, but we can't identify which ones have malicious features and which don't. But without knowing anything more, I can make a statement about all these programs, and that is their developers are human, so they make mistakes. The code of these programs has bugs, and the user of a program without Freedom 1 is just as helpless facing an accidental error as facing a deliberate malicious feature. If you use a program that lacks Freedom 1, you are a prisoner of the software you use. We, the developers of free software, are human too. So we also make mistakes. The code of our software has bugs. But if you find a bug in the code of our free software, or anything in the code you don't like, you are free to change it because we did not make you our prisoner. We can't be perfect. 
we can respect your freedom. So freedom, one, is essential. But it's not enough. Because that is the freedom to personally study and change the source code. Or within one organization. This is not enough because there are millions of users that don't know how to program. They don't know how to exercise freedom number one directly. But even for programmers like me, freedom one is not enough because we're busy doing other things. And besides, there's so much software in the world. There's so much free software in the world today that no user is capable of personally studying and mastering the source code of all the programs she uses, nor personally writing all the changes that she might wish for. The only way to fully take control of our computing is to do it working together, cooperating. And for that, we need freedom three. The freedom to contribute to your community. The freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions. That freedom allows us to work together. Because if there's a program we use and people would like a certain improvement, somebody can write that improvement and then publish his modified version and then we can all use it if we want to. So the result is it's not necessary for each one of us to write the same improvement. It's enough to write it once and then employing Freedom 3 to make this available to everyone. so hot in here that I have to keep drinking but it so I can cope but it really would be nice if they could make it a bit colder anyway so freedom three is also essential and all the users get the benefit of the four freedoms every user can exercise freedoms zero and two to run the program as you wish, and to redistribute exact copies when you wish, because these don't involve programming. Any user can exercise these two freedoms. Freedoms one and three, the freedom to study and change the source code, and then optionally distribute copies of your modified version, these involve programming. So any given user is more or less able to exercise these freedoms according to how much she knows how to program. And of course, many people don't learn to program. They can't directly exercise these freedoms. But when others who are programmers exercise these freedoms, and when they publish their modified versions, then every user can install those modified versions or not, as he pleases. And thus, all the users get the benefit of living in a society where we all have these four freedoms. And the four freedoms together give us democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Because every user is free to participate as much as she wishes in society's decision about the future of the program, which is simply the sum total of all the various users' decisions. of what they do with the program. By contrast, a proprietary program develops under the dictatorship of its developer. The developer has sole power. The developer decides what the program will do and what it won't do. And the program then serves as an instrument of this developer's power, an instrument to subjugate the users. And then the developer can command them, exploit them, and abuse them. So society has a choice to make. On one side, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. On the other, we have the dictatorship of the developer. 
society must choose free software and reject proprietary software. The ultimate goal of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace and all of its inhabitants. All of you deserve freedom. I hope you will all join me in the free world. I started the free software movement in 1983. During the 1970s, I was part of a free software community. I worked in a lab at MIT where we shared software. And I learned that that was a good way of life. And then the community died under commercial pressure. And it became impossible to use a computer and have freedom. I wanted to change that. I wanted to be able to use computers in freedom. So what could I do? Very few people agreed with me. So I didn't think we would get very far starting an ordinary political movement where we would protest with signs and send letters. And besides, I had no experience doing that kind of thing. I was an operating system developer. Hmm. But being an operating system developer, that suggested another way I could achieve the same result. All I had to do was write another operating system. You see, the reason it was impossible in 1983 to use a computer in freedom was that the computer won't do anything without an operating system. And all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary. So if I wrote another operating system, then I, being the author, could legally make it free software, and then everybody would be able to run a computer in freedom using my system. In other words, I would be able to eliminate this injustice of proprietary software, or at least give people a, a place to escape from it to, through technical work in my own field. So I was aware of an injustice that most people did not recognize as an injustice. I had the skills necessary to try to eliminate the injustice, and it looked like nobody was going to do it if not me. That meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work. It was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning, and you know how to swim, and there's no one else around, and it's not Bush. <laughs> then you have a moral duty to save that person. <laughs> but perhaps the statement I've made is too strong. Perhaps some executives of BP <laughs> should be Perhaps we, we could identify some about whom I should not make the claim that you have a duty to save them. And whether to include President Obama is not clear. He continues most of the kinds of torture that Bush started uh, and protects the torturers and continues wars of occupation and continues disappearances of people. They're kidnapped and taken to secret prisons, perhaps in Afghanistan, and the U.S. government doesn't even admit that they are prisoners. So, but fortunately, I don't need to resolve these questions because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> but in the case that really occurred, the work to be done was not swimming, it was writing lots of software. And that I knew how to do. So I decided to write a free software operating system or die trying. Of old age, that is. Because at the time, the free software movement which I was founding had no active enemies. When I told people about it, a lot of them thought it was silly, but they didn't bother trying to stop the work. 
they were sure that the job of making a complete free operating system was so big that we would never be able to do it. And I too recognized it was a very big job. I didn't know if we would be able to finish a complete free operating system, but at the same time I realized that failure was not an option. We had to develop one. Because without a free operating system, we would never have freedom if we were computer users. So, I decided to develop a complete free operating system. I decided to recruit other people to join in and help to finish it sooner. I decided to follow the design of Unix because Unix was a portable operating system. It could run on various different kinds of computers from different manufacturers. I also wanted to make a system that would be portable and following the design of Unix seemed like the most reliable way to achieve that goal. And then I decided to implement the same commands that Unix had. In other words, to make it upward compatible so that all the people who already knew how to use Unix could switch to my system and they wouldn't have to learn very much. They could just start using it. And then I gave it the name GNU, which is a joke. Because part of the spirit of that community which died was since we were programming for the fascination of programming, it's true, some of us were employees and the rest were mostly students, but that was all secondary. The fascination of programming was why we were there. And to make it even more fun, we used to give our programs funny names. Because when you imagine the users laughing at the name, that gives you the motivation to finish the program so it will have users to laugh. The name GNU is a joke because it's a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix. G-N-U, GNU's Not Unix. And of course, programmers love humor based on recursion. <laughs> but the reason I called it GNU and not ANU or SNU or PNU is that GNU is a word. In fact, it's just about the funniest word in the English language because it's used in lots of jokes. You see, according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced NU. So anytime you want to write the word NU, you can spell it G N U and you have a joke. <laughs> Perhaps not a very good joke, <laughs> but there are lots of them. So as soon as you see the word GNU, you're primed to laugh already. Given the opportunity to use this as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. But when it's the name of our operating system, please do not follow the dictionary. Because if you say the the new system, you'll get people confused. You see, we've been working on it for 26 years now, and using it for 18 years, it's not new anymore. <laughs> but it still is GNU. So please pronounce it GNU. Avoid the pronunciation, the confusing pronunciation, GNU. And there's another erroneous pronunciation you should avoid. <coughs> which sounds like Linux. <laughs> but how did such a gross error ever get started? What happened was that in 1984, I and others started writing the, the hundreds of pieces we would need for the GNU system. And <clears throat> By 1992, we had almost all the system. Some of the pieces we had written, some we had found. But in any case, we had almost a complete free operating system. However, one major essential component was missing. That was the kernel. 
The kernel of the system is the component that allocates the machine's resources to all the other programs that you run. We were working on a kernel in 1992, but that project just hasn't really worked well. However, in 92, Mr. Torvalds, who had written a kernel called Linux, released it as free software. Linux existed in 1991, but it was not free software then. Its license was too restrictive. It did not allow commercial distribution, which meant that certain users, namely businesses, could not have Freedom 2 or Freedom 3. And if the license of a program doesn't allow all users to have these freedoms, it's not free software. But in 92, Torvalds made Linux free software by releasing it under the GNU General Public License, which is the most widely used free software license. It's the one that I wrote for use in the programs that we wrote for the GNU system. But I set it up so that anybody else can easily use it too. <clears throat> so when Linux became free software, the combination of the almost complete GNU system and Linux was a complete free operating system. And for the first time it was possible to buy a new PC and run it in freedom. So the liberation of Linux by releasing it under the GNU GPL was an important contribution to the free software community. But the people who put Linux together with all the pieces of the GNU system were focused so much on Linux that they thought of all the rest of the system as a small add-on. And they started calling the whole thing a Linux system. And other people imitated them. And that's how it happened that millions of people use this variant of the GNU system. And most of them don't know that it's basically the GNU system. They think it's Linux and that it was all started by Mr. Torvalds in 1991. That's not fair to us, so please don't call the system Linux. If you use the system, please call it GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux. Give us equal mention. We started it, so we certainly deserve at least that much. Uh, so if you use the system, please call yourself a GNU slash Linux user. And, uh, when you're talking about the various versions of the system that are available to install, please call them GNU slash Linux distributions. And when you're talking about a, a computer that's running the system, please call it a GNU slash Linux box, and, et cetera. But it's true that credit is not the most important ethical issue in life. And if it were just about credit, it would not be worth so much attention. But there's something much more important at stake in your choice of the name to call the system. And that is your freedom. Your freedom is at stake. Indirectly, of course. Because directly, the choice of names doesn't change anything. But indirectly, it influences people. If you call a rose an onion, it will still smell as sweet, but cooks will get confused. <laughs> the words you choose determine the message you communicate to other people. And that message exercises influence over other people's thoughts which then determine their actions. So over time, you do influence others through your choice of words. Since 26 years ago, the name GNU has been associated with the ideas of freedom that I've told you today. The name Linux is associated with different ideas, with the ideas of Mr. Torvalds. And what are they? He doesn't value freedom. He doesn't think that software users deserve freedom. 
He doesn't even think he deserves freedom. He doesn't value it. He, is, he says that he's happy to use proprietary software as long as it's convenient. So what he's saying is, value convenience, not freedom. He has a right to his views. But it's not right that the tremendous job that we did for the sake of freedom be misattributed to him and then serve as his platform to oppose the views that motivated us to do the work. And it's dangerous for all of us because when people think that he started the whole thing, they tend to admire him so much that they copy his views. They adopt his views, which means they don't value their own freedom. They don't learn to value freedom. And that means that when we have to fight to defend our freedom, they won't be with us. And because of that, we could lose. <clears throat> our future depends above all on what we value. If we want to have freedom, we have to value freedom and we have to act based on that value. Freedom is frequently threatened. To keep it, you have to defend it. You can see that through all of history, up through the way Bush damaged human rights all around the world. Now, in order to defend freedom, you have to value freedom. And in order to value freedom, you have to understand the concept. In most areas of life, which are not new, after all, most areas of life have been around for quite some time. And the debate about human rights in most areas of life has gone on for decades or centuries. Plenty of time to reach conclusions about what human rights people deserve and spread those conclusions around the world. Now that doesn't assure we always succeed in defending human rights. In the past 10 years, we have lost a lot of battles. But at least it gives us a base to try. However, computing is a fairly new area of life. It's not even 20 years that most people in a few advanced countries have been using computers. And in other countries, it's even less time since most people began using computers. That's not much time to have a debate about what human rights you deserve in using a program. It's not much time, even if there had been a debate. But for the most part, there has been no debate. Almost everyone started using computers with proprietary software, surrounded by other users of proprietary software. Proprietary software was the only possibility they knew of. So they took for granted that software can be proprietary, that proprietary software is normal and legitimate and acceptable, which means that, in effect, they allowed the proprietary developers to dictate the answer to the question, what human rights do you deserve in using a program? And they dictated the answer, just about none at all which is the answer that was most convenient for them, most profitable for them. And people mostly accepted this, except for us in the free software movement. We reject that position. We are trying to start a debate about the subject because we believe we have identified Fox for human rights that you deserve in using a program namely the four freedoms that define free software. But when we try to bring these ideas to the attention of the public, and even to the attention of the users of our own we have to overcome, we have to surmount two large obstacles. One is, the users don't know it's our system. They don't know that they're using the GNU system. They think that they're using Linux and that the system was 
developed by Mr. Torvalds in 1991, and they know that he doesn't care about freedom for the users. So when they see the articles where we explain these ideas of freedom, they say to themselves, oh, this is another piece of propaganda from GNU. Why should I read that? After all, I'm a Linux user. And when they say Linux, they're actually talking about the GNU system. How ironic. If only they knew that they're users of the GNU system and that the system that they probably like exists because of these ideas, they might pay more attention to these ideas. We would have a chance to convince them. And we would convince some of them. And that way, our movement for freedom would be stronger. But today, we have to overcome another obstacle, which is that they don't know the term free software either. Most of the people who talk about our software don't call it free or electoral. They have another term. They call it open source. That term was invented in 1998 by the people who didn't agree with us as a way of hiding our ideals. You see, during the 1990s, as the GNU plus Linux, GNU plus Linux system started to catch on among techies. Many of them appreciated, for its, appreciated it for practical reasons. It was powerful, reliable, efficient, flexible, and you could run it cheaply. So they recommended it to others, but they didn't think or talk about freedom. So we, of course, tried to tell them about freedom. So in the 90s, there were two camps in our community, two political camps. There were those of us who valued freedom and social solidarity, and there was the other camp of people who only valued practical convenience, people like Torvalds. In 1998, that second group invented the term open source, which had not been used before. So they were able to choose which ideas to associate with it and which ideas to leave out. And they chose to leave out the entire ethical level of the issue. So they never say that there are freedoms that you deserve in using software. They don't say that proprietary software is an injustice. Instead, they say that they recommend a development method which is likely to result in software of higher quality. So the only values they appeal to are values of convenience. Higher quality software, that's a convenience value. And by focusing on that, they can direct people's attention far away from the issue of freedom, which for us is the central point. Well, even in 1998, there were already a number of businesses involved with free software. They developed free software or distributed free software or both. But most of them were also connected with proprietary software. And they did not want to teach the users to value freedom. Because if the users valued freedom, they would not be potential customers for proprietary software. So these businesses preferred to say open source. And of course, the politicians and the journalists mostly followed the businesses. So ever since then, when people hear about our work, usually they hear it described as, quote, open source, unquote, and they get entirely the wrong idea of what its purpose is and what the idea ideas are that motivated it. So ever since then, in order to spread the free software ideas, we have to drive it home to people that we are not supporters of open source and we don't think the same thing that those people say. In fact, I've seen articles that describe me as the father of open source. 
I sent letters to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, then it was conceived through artificial insemination using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. I used that joke to introduce an explanation of the philosophical difference and thus inform people about the free software movement. And that's what I'm doing here today. That's what we have to do constantly because when people talk about our work, if they associate our work with the wrong ideas, they're not helping us at all. So we need your help to tell people these ideas of free software and freedom. People need to start to see how proprietary software restricts them and how it frequently is designed to put handcuffs on them. They have to recognize that this is an injustice, it's an evil system, and we have to put an end to it. And then they can join us and help. So, we're going to need you to help us do this. Now, you can do a lot of work to help. You can learn to give speeches like this one. That would be really useful. You can. Uh, get involved in free software activist organizations. That's also a very effective way to help. You can also help by writing free software. We need more of that too. But we actually have more people writing free software than we have campaigning for software freedom. So the place we need you most is at the campaigning level. Because it's very easy to lose your freedom. Life offers you lots of opportunities to throw away your freedom. Lots of people will offer you some kind of increased convenience if only you let him have certain kinds of power over you. And if you haven't learned to recognize why that's foolish, you might do it. So, if we want to establish freedom in a lasting way, it's not enough just to give people freedom. We have to teach people to want freedom as well. So if we could magically get free software tomorrow to do all the jobs that people want to do, we could give that out to people and then tomorrow they could all have freedom. But would they still have freedom in five years? Not necessarily. Because if they didn't appreciate the freedom that they would have, they might accept an offer to gain some convenience by giving up their freedom again. And we can see how easy this is by looking at our own community's history. Several times in the free software community, among the users of the GNU slash Linux system, we had freedom and then most of us lost it because our community did not pay attention. In 1992, when Linux was combined with the almost complete GNU system, it made the GNU slash Linux system, and you could get a PC and install the system, but it wasn't easy. You had to be an expert then. So people started making it easier. They made <coughs> distributions of GNU slash Linux designed to make it easier to install. And so a few years later there were several distributions competing. And the developers of one of the distributions had a bright idea for how to gain more popularity. They could add some non-free programs to their distribution and present those to the users as a bonus, saying, use our distribution, look at what you get. Presenting this no, these non-free programs that would take away the user's freedom as if they were an advantage rather than a threat. And it worked because most of the users didn't appreciate freedom either. So they chose this distribution, more of them did. And then the developers of other distributions looked at that and said, uh-oh, they have an advantage. We have to get rid of their advantage, so we have to put in 
the same non-free programs or similar ones in our distribution too. And so over a few years, all the distributions put in non-free software. And the result was, 10 years ago, when people asked me, where can I get a copy of this system? I had to say, I'm sorry, I don't know any place I can recommend to you because all of the distributions, and by then there were maybe a hundred distributions, all the distributions contain non-free software, so I can't recommend them. I'm happy, so in effect we had reached freedom and we had fallen back and lost it because we didn't care enough, most of us, to keep it. Well, I'm happy to say that today there are completely free distributions of Gnome slash Linux. For instance, there is Ututo, U-T-U-T-O. And there is BLAG, which stands for BLAG, Linux, and GNU. Another recursive acronym. And there is GNUsense. And there is Treescale. And there are a few others. The list of them is in gnu.org slash distros. But these are not the well-known distros. These are not the ones you've probably heard of. Because the well-known popular distros continue to contain non-free software. So we have begun to recover the freedom we let go of. But just begun. We have a long way to go to reach the point where we can be confident that anyone who's installing the GNU slash Linux system is only installing free software. And then we lost our freedom in other ways. For instance, today the source code of Linux is not entirely free software. If you look at Torvalds's version of Linux, you'll find in some of the quote, source files, unquote, large tables of numbers, up to 300,000 numbers in a table. And these tables are really executable programs dressed up as source code. But the real source code for those programs is not available, which means they are not free software. You can't make a table of numbers into source code just by uh, including it in a source file and calling it a, a vector of numbers. <clears throat> in addition, many of these tables explicitly carry non-free licenses. So, what can we do? We have to maintain our own version of Linux, which is free. It's called Linux Libre which it means free Linux in Spanish. And what we do is we delete those non-free blobs. Because if you want a completely free version of GNU slash Linux, in particular you need your copy of Linux to be completely free software also. So, these are two examples, but there are others. It's very easy to lose your freedom if you don't appreciate it. So, please help us stand up for the idea of free software and freedom. Help educate others. Nowadays, there's a new way to lose control of your computing. It's called software as a service. With software as a service, instead of doing your computing on your data in your own computer, you send the data to someone else's server, and the, your computing is done by, there by software, well, you don't know what software, and then it sends you back the results. Or it may act for you directly based on those results. But the point is, it's done some computing based on the data you sent. And you don't control that computing because it's being done in somebody else's server. So, software as a service is 
equivalent to proprietary software in that both of them take away your control of your computing. Now, some proprietary programs have a malicious feature called spyware, where they send data about the use of the machine to someone else, the developer or someone related to the developer. This requires explicit code to send out messages with the information. But with software as a service, the same result follows automatically from the nature of the, of the scheme. Because the users have to send their data to the server, so the server has that data. And what they'll do with that data afterwards, the users have no way of knowing. Some proprietary programs have a back door that allows the developer to forcibly install changes in that software. With software as a service, the equivalent result is always true because the server operator can change the software on the server at any time. And that changes the way the user's computing is being done. So software as a service is equivalent to a proprietary program with spyware and a dangerous backdoor. You, for your freedom's sake, you must reject that proprietary software and you must reject software as a service also. So if somebody's website offers to do your computing for you, you have to say no. Now, this is a small minority of websites. Most web services are not software as a service because what they're doing is not your own computing. It's either making data available to you or it's doing publication for you or communication with you. And those are different kinds of activities. You couldn't do them within your own computer. You can't communicate with me just by staying within your own computer because I would never get it. Uh, communication can't be done purely within your own computer at all. So it's a different kind of issue. But when it comes to doing your computing, there you need to reject the offer to let somebody else's server do it for you. <clears throat> To close, I would like to mention a couple of other specific topics. One is free software and employment. Sometimes our adversaries try to suggest that if the world switches to free software, we would have a disaster for employment. That's ridiculous. Look at the employment in the IT sector. Paid programming software development is a small fraction of that. Most of it is people being paid to use software. Free software just helps that. But what about the paid programming? A small fraction of that is development of proprietary software products. The rest is development of custom software. Custom software means the program is being written for a particular client and that client is paying to get it written. If the world moves to free software, if the users all understand they should demand freedom, and they do, then this, these jobs developing proprietary software, they will disappear. But these jobs in custom software, they will stay basically the same. Because the same clients are still going to have to pay the same people to write this software. And these jobs will be the same where they might increase. Meanwhile, free software generates employment, programming employment. You see, that's because, because users can pay people to adapt and extend free software. They can't do that with proprietary software. If you wanted to pay somebody to adapt and extend Windows or Mac OS or the or some other proprietary program you've heard of for your needs, you can't because 
I mean, there could be a programmer who's capable of doing the job, but he can't have the source code. So he can't do the job. But with free software, you can pay the programmer of your choice to do that kind of work. It's like, you know, changing your house. If you don't know how to do it yourself, there are lots of plumbers and carpenters who could do it for you. And they'd be happy to do that work for you. And in fact, that's a lot of employment. So what we see is a certain small fraction of the IT sector employment would disappear and there'd be some new employment. Well, whether this means more employment or less, I don't know. But what's clear is the worst possible case is not very bad. It's a small loss. It can't be worse than that. So there's nothing to fear. That's the crucial point. The second specific topic is free software and education. Schools and the whole educational system must teach free software and only free software. There are four reasons for this. The most superficial one is to save money. Even in the richest countries, the schools don't have enough money. They must not spend some of their limited budget paying for permission to run non-free software. This is a benefit that comes about from the fact that once a school has a copy of a free program, it's free to install as copies in as many of its computers as it wishes and doesn't have to get permission to do this. And a whole school system can do this too because this is part of the four freedoms. So people can appreciate this benefit even without understanding what free software really means. But precisely for that reason, we must not make the mistake of focusing too much on this one superficial reason. We need to educate people to recognize the importance of freedom. And besides, there are some proprietary software companies that will eliminate this reason by donating gratis copies of their non-free software to schools. And why do they do this? They are trying to use the schools as instruments to impose dependence on their product on all of society. Here's how their plan works. They deliver these gratis copies to the school, the school teaches the students to use them, and the students develop a dependence on the product. Then they graduate with the dependence. And after they graduate, the same developer is not going to offer them gratis copies. And they go to work in companies. The developer is not going to offer them, to offer these companies gratis copies either. So the idea is the school directs the students down the path of permanent dependence and they pull the rest of society with them. <coughs> It's just like offering the school gratis doses of addictive drugs, saying, inject these into your students to make them dependent. The first dose is gratis. Once you're dependent, then you have to pay. The school would reject these drugs, and it should reject the proprietary software too, because the school has a social mission to educate good citizens of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society. And in computing, the only way to do that is to teach people to be free software users. Teaching the use of proprietary software is spreading dependence, and that's the opposite of the mission of the school. But there's a deeper motive for the education of the best programmers. You see, some people are natural born programmers 
and at the age of 10 to 13 years, they're fascinated and they want to learn everything about the system and the computer and how they do this. But when a youth asks the teacher, how does this program do this? If it's proprietary, the teacher can only respond, I'm sorry, we can't find out, it's a secret. And thus, education cannot begin. Proprietary software is knowledge withheld. It's the enemy of the spirit of education and it should never be tolerated in any school. But if the program is free, the teacher can explain what he knows and then say, here's the source code of this program. Read it and you'll understand everything. And that youth will read it because that youth yearns to understand everything. And then if the teacher can say, if you encounter any point you can't figure out, show it to me and we'll figure it out together. And this gives our natural born programmer the chance to learn something very important. That code is not clear, so don't write it that way. And this is a very important lesson. You see, you don't have to teach these people to program because for them it's obvious. But programming well is something else. The way you learn to write good, clear code is by seeing lots of examples of code that isn't clear and seeing why it isn't clear and learning not to write it that way. You have to read lots of code and write lots of code. Only free software offers the opportunity to read lots of code of programs that we really use. And then you have to write lots of code. How do you learn to write code for a large program? You have to start small, which means writing small changes, small additions of code to a large program. You don't learn anything about the difficulties of large programs by writing small programs because the challenges of large programs don't even begin to appear in small programs. So the only way you can start small is to take an existing large program and write a change for it. And only free software gives you the chance to do that. That's how I learned. I worked at MIT in this lab where we had a free software community, we had a free operating system and my job was to make it better. So I had to read a piece of an existing large free program and then write some changes for it. And then read some of it another free program and write changes for it. And that's what most of the work is, writing changes to existing programs. Starting a new program is rare. Improving existing ones is most of the work. So, if we want to teach those people who have the appropriate talent to be really good programmers, we need to give them the chance to practice. And free software offers it, proprietary software doesn't. I had an opportunity in the 1970s that was nearly unique, but today, any school can offer this opportunity if it is a free software school. But there's an even deeper reason, and that is for the sake of moral education. Education and citizenship. Because schools have to teach not just facts and skills, but above all, the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping other people. So every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class including the source code, in case someone would like to learn. Because this is a place where we share our knowledge. Every class, every school must have this rule. But the school, in order to set a good example, has to follow its own rule. It has to bring only free software to class and bring it with the source code. If you are connected with the school in any fashion, then it's your duty to campaign to move that school to free software, to remove and eliminate the proprietary software there. <coughs> so now, I'd like to mention a few websites where you can get more information. There is GNU.org, 
the website of the GNU project and the free software movement. There is also fsf.org, the website of the Free Software Foundation, which campaigns for free software. And on that site you can find various resources that are helpful to using free software. You can also find our political campaigns. For instance, we started a campaign of protests against digital restrictions management called defectivebydesign.org. If you go to that site, you can sign up and we'll inform you about our protests. Most of the protests are done through the net, so you can participate easily from anywhere in the world. Please sign up and participate in our protests because the mission is to show some large companies that if they design products to attack our freedom, they will be hated. And there's also the Free Software Foundation Europe, fsfe.org, which also needs your help. And you can, uh, you can join the Free Software Foundation that's another thing you can do at fsf.org, but you can also join here if you wish, paying cash, because you have to pay your dues. So if you wish to join here, come talk to me, but you can also do it through the site using e-commerce. So now I would like to present my other identity. <laughs> I am Saint Ignatius. <laughs> of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Emacs started out as a text editor that I wrote, an extensible text editor, which became a way of life for many users because it was extended so much that they could do all their computing inside Emacs. And then it became a religion with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs, <laughs> which you might be amused to visit. Today in the Church of Emacs, we have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs. And we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we worship an editor. <laughs> to be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must recite the Confession of the Faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> If you become a real expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, in which you chant lines from the system source code. We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs. The Virgin of Emacs is anyone who has not yet learned to use Emacs. And According to the Church of Emacs, offering the Virgin the chance to lose Emacs virginity is considered a blessed act. There is also the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't mention. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. 
But it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use. And then install a wholly free operating system. <laughs> and then only install and use free software with and on the system. If you make that vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint. And you too will have the right to wear a halo. <laughs> if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> People have sometimes asked whether in the Church of Emacs it is considered a sin to use the other editor, VI. <laughs> it's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> And uh, no, my Halo is not an old computer disk, but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.